Welcome back in, everybody. Hope you're doing well. It's the 21 season. It's the Kansas City Chiefs. Thank you for joining us again. Hope you're doing fantastic this week. We are just after week three. Kansas City just finished the game against the Chargers a couple of days ago. Of course, a loss to the Chargers. Kansas City is now one and two. You know that. You also know that they've already started this season off with three good teams. Okay, the Browns, the Ravens, and the Chargers. That's going to cause this 1-2 and two record to some degree. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on why they lost this game or why they maybe should have won it. I think it's clear Kansas City could have and, and maybe should have won this game when you look at the way the game ended especially. Another wild, crazy game between two good teams. Kansas City comes out on the opposite end of it. They, they could be 3-0 and oh right now with a couple of different play, play outcomes. They, they, they could have even lost the game that they won. Um, versus Cleveland, they, 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 they look bad for a large part of that game. So it's been a, it's been a wacky ride, but we're going to spend a lot more time on this video talking about some of the position grades and some of the player grades and less about the actual outcome of the game itself. So this is what we're going to start with, the offensive line, Patrick Mahomes, um, the secondary very quickly, and then I'll shift over to the defensive line and some of the guys over there on defense. And I've got two diagrams to talk about today as well, let's start right here with Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes had a lot of yardage. He was able to consistently move the football up and down the field. The Chargers were not able to stop him from doing that. But what the Chargers were able to do, and this is important, they were able to get him to have a lot more incompletions than what Mahomes normally has. He was somewhere around, I think it was 60%, much lower. And that's one of the reasons I downgrade Mahomes to a B. Now, it's important to note Mahomes was throwing on the run a lot. He had a lot of pressure on him throughout the entire game. The offensive line was not able to protect Mahomes consistently. There were, there were certain plays where they did, but there were a lot of plays where Mahomes is just getting a lot of pressure. He's having to move, and he's having to throw under duress, and he's having to make decisions a little bit more quickly than he might otherwise have to make them. So his completion percentage goes significantly down versus what we usually see him at. I don't downgrade him on that first interception in the first quarter. He is a little sloppy, a little messy, but again, he's throwing on the run. He's throwing under duress. He got the ball to the receiver on the left shoulder, I think it was. The ball could have been caught. I don't know that the ball should have been caught. The ball bounces up in the air, and the, the, the Chargers secondary guy made a, a fantastic play on it. You know, we're talking a few inches as to whether or not that ball just lands on the ground and the, and the Chiefs go right on and, and, and score. Those turnovers early in the game, I think there were three turnovers in the first half alone. Those turnovers right there are basically the difference in the game. If Kansas City is able to hold on to the football a little bit better. And again, the Tyreek Hill play was kind of weird. And, and, and then we have another uh, fumble from Edwards Elaire. So again, those turnovers really, really made it bad. But the point is, Mahomes was under pressure under duress for large portions of that game. The offensive line was not able to protect him, so the completion percentage goes down, and his decision-making, the amount of time he has to make it, goes down as well. So I don't downgrade him on that first interception, but the second interception late in the game, I understand he's trying to make a play, but really he made two mistakes on that second interception. He probably should never have thrown that ball in the first place. Uh, there really wasn't anybody open on that. Kelsey, I think, was the intended receiver. Kelsey really wasn't open. Kelsey was just kind of scrambling, looking for some space. But Mahomes made a bad throw. It, it just wasn't a good throw. It wasn't on target. Kelsey had, like, zero chance to catch the football. So I downgrade Mahomes for those two reasons, the completion percentage down significantly and that second interception, where I understand he's trying to make a play, but really makes two mistakes on that as well. So even though he, he moved the ball up and down the football field a lot, not, uh, not your best, best day from Patrick Mahomes. It comes down to this right here, the offensive line. In pass coverage, they were lousy. Now, I, I'm not turning out specific grades for the interior guards and the centers today, just the tackles. But overall, as an offensive line, they didn't do a good job pass protecting. And this right here, pass protection, getting a D from the offensive line, that's what drags down Mahomes' grades. If the Chiefs can find a way, somehow, some way, to get this offensive line pass blocking back up to at least a C. Not even asking for them to be spectacular. If they can just get it back up to a C level where they're kind of consistently providing some kind of a clean pocket for Mahomes, 
for most of the game, then Mahomes' grades shoot right back up to the A's and the A-plus levels like we're all used to. But these two are directly correlated. As we know, when this goes down, it drags down the, the quarterback grade with it, no matter who that quarterback is. I don't care if you're Tom Brady. When the pressure is there and they've got to move around and they have less time or they're throwing on the run, that grade is going down. Now, here's the interesting thing. The offensive line actually did a pretty good job in, in, in run blocking this game. And, and that was across the board from both the tackles and the interior guards. They did an excellent job. We'll get into Orlando Brown and, and Niang specifically in a second. They actually did a very good job. Now, why only a C plus? Because I, I think they had three, th uh, 30 carries for 186 yards. Well, it, the reason I only gave them a C plus for this game is a lot of those carries, a lot of those rushing yards were done around the end. So they were wide receiver sweeps or they were some kind of, of, of run around the end where, to be honest, the offensive line wasn't really responsible for, for the rushing yards created there. But in spite of that, when you go back and you look at the tape, you can see the offensive line getting on a lot of good, solid, consistent blocks, opening holes up the middle for the running backs for Kansas City, and getting to the second level and blocking guys in the second level as well. So a C-plus there for the offensive line in run blocking for this game against the Chargers. They, they really did well with it. And again, Kansas City did a good job of establishing the run, not only up the middle, but around the edges. Excellent day for Kansas City running the football. I think that's something we all kind of wanted to see heading into the season so with some power running game and, and then some running around the end. And the offensive line appear, uh, appears capable of doing that. Okay, so D on the pass coverage for the offensive line, C plus for uh, run blocking. Let's get to Orlando Brown, left tackle. I'm, I've covered him almost every video this year. We're probably going to continue to do that just because there's so much involved and so much at stake. Orlando Brown, I've got him broken up into three different grades here, okay? And, and, and I'll start with Lucas Nyank here as well at the same time. The first one, the D letters, that's for when they were going up against Joey Bosa. Basically, when they were trying to stop Joey Bosa, whether it was Brown or Nyank, either one, they basically had no shot. No matter where Bosa lined up, he was able to beat his man. Now, Bosa only had half a sack, and he didn't really get credited with a lot of quarterback pressures and quarterback hurries. And, 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 and this is where you really start to see, and I'll talk about this with Chris Jones in a second, you really start to see that sacks are one of the most overrated statistics and one of the most random statistics, not just in the NFL, but in all of North American sports. Sacks really just are not a good indicator of whether or not a guy had a good game or a good season. Now, in general, the better pass rushers and edge rushers will accrue more sacks, but they're just not consistent. That sack number just isn't consistent, and neither is the quarterback pressures or the quarterback hits, because the way they count those quarterback pressures and hits, the, the defender, whoever's doing the edge rushing, has to kind of be sort of within arm's reach or touching reach of the quarterback for that to really count as a pressure or as a hit in most cases. Again, everybody counts those a little bit differently. But the point is this, Joey Bosa wore out both tackles for the Chiefs during this game. He basically could beat either man, even though he only, he only got half a sack and not many pressures. He basically beat his man the entire game, no matter where he was coming from, the outside, the inside. It, great game for Joey Bosa, outstanding game, even though the numbers won't indicate that. Joey Bosa just had a dominant, dominant day. So did Chris Jones. We'll get to him in a second. But this is one reason why I think defensive ends get a little bit overrated in football and maybe a little bit too high paid because the quarterbacks, even though Bosa was able to consistently beat his man, Mahomes is just good enough to roll out or get rid of the ball before Bosa can ever get there. So, you know, it's good to have a defensive end who can get pressure on, but these quarterbacks, especially the better ones, the, the, the upper half of the league, they are so quick at getting rid of the football and at knowing where their drop-off points are. It can limit them somewhat, but again, uh, pressure up the middle, I think, is actually more important and better than pressure off the edge because the, those defensive ends just cannot get there quick enough for these quarterbacks to let go of that football. Um, so basically, Orlando Brown, Lucas Niang, 
get D grades, they had absolutely no chance at stopping Joel Bosa at any point in this game at all. Versus everybody else, I give them a C minus grade, both tackles. Niang and, and, and uh, uh, Orlando Brown both, they fought hard in this game against anybody besides Joey Bosa. They actually kind of sort of held their own. They didn't dominate. They didn't look great. Not even totally sure they looked average, but at least they were fighting. They were putting a fight out of it. They were, they were making it a battle, and they were able to, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, keep pressure off of Mahomes when they weren't being attacked by somebody named Joey Bosa. Okay, so the Bosa grades are uh, these. Everybody else is C minuses uh, for the tackles where they kind of sort of held their own during this game. Um, Orlando Brown here in the running game. Actually, Orlando Brown looked really good, and, and I give him a B minus grade here. And that's that means you don't just deserve to be on the football field. You're actually making a difference. Orlando Brown did two things very well. He teamed up with Joe Tooney on multiple double teams in the running game, and they were just able, of course, to obliterate. Nobody was getting through Brown and and Tooney when they were working together in the running game. Absolutely outstanding. But where you really started to see a difference here for Orlando Brown in the running game, he was able multiple times, you can see it on the video, to chip whoever was uh, whoever uh, Joe Tooney was blocking and actually get to the second level and make a sustained block on the linebackers in the running game against the against the Chargers. So uh, Luke, uh, Orlando Brown gets a B minus for his blocking in the running game. Actually, did very well uh, in, in in run blocking during this game, and, and it really showed up. He he's, he appears eager to do that. He looks very fluid in run blocking. He seems very able to get to that second level, and he's not just getting there. He's actually blocking somebody, and he's actually sustaining that block in the second level. Sometimes those linebackers are quick enough to slip those blocks. But Orlando Brown is doing a good job, at least in the Chargers game, in run blocking, of helping out Joe Tooney and then moving to the second level and blocking somebody there and, and, and really opening up more holes for the running backs downfield, right? So excellent, excellent work by Orlando Brown in run blocking, not so much in the pass blocking, particularly on Joey Bosa. Now, again, to be fair, Joey Bosa is going to wear out a lot of tackles in the league. But here's the important point. Before I leave Brown, I'll continue to make this all, all season long. If, if you just understand that your tackles are bad and you're going to have to scheme around that all year long, that's fine. Every NFL team has some weakness that they have to scheme around. Okay, But if you're looking ahead the next offseason and you're thinking about paying a lot of money to Orlando Brown, there's no way you can justify it even after the trade there is no way you can justify it when he cannot at least make a battle versus Joey Bosa closer and more even than that. I said it the same thing the first week against Miles Garrett. We don't expect you to shut down Miles Garrett. We don't expect you to shut down Joey Bosa, but it's got to be more of an even fight. And so far in both of those battles against those elite edge rushers, Orlando Brown has no chance at blocking either one of them at any point of either game. And in fact, is getting a lot of help from Blake Bell and from the running backs just to try to slow those edge rushers down a little bit. Okay, so that's the point here that we're trying to make with Orlando Brown. Going to have to see some better battles against those top edge rushers. It's just got to be more of a fight than what he's able to do so far. He still looks stiff. He still looks uncomfortable in pass blocking. He, he still looks like this is not his natural spot, okay? And so that's what we're looking at here. I'm not trying to rip him down, but I am trying to look ahead and see if you're Kansas City, should you really be investing this kind of money in left tackle? Because so far, it, it is not paying off, okay? Same thing with Lucas Niang here. I didn't produce a run grade for him. Um, it, it, at times this year against other average players, and, and listen, they went up against plenty of average or below average Chargers, linebackers, and defensive ends, and they kind of sort of held their own, but they didn't look great, and, and Yang still has a long way to go to keep pressure off of Mahomes as well, okay? Secondary, I, I tossed it over here, complete F for the secondary. This is one of, and, and again, I, I haven't broken down the tape on all the games, this is one of the worst performances we've seen from the secondary um, for, for the last three or four years for Kansas City Chiefs. I really don't know what these guys were doing or, or where they were. 
And I don't have my all 22 yet this season, so I haven't been able to break the secondary down the way I want to. Maybe we'll have it soon, or I haven't checked it today. Maybe we've already got our all 22 film back from NFL Game Pass. But I, I've, I've had plenty of time, plenty of film to be able to look at the offensive line and defensive lines. Uh, and I'll be able to produce some better grades on the secondary, hopefully here in a week or two. But until that time, it, what I saw of this game, a disaster from the secondary in, in, in this week against the, against the Chargers, and it seemed to be everybody. I mean, it seemed to be Hughes. It seemed to be Baker. It seemed to be Snead. I mean, everybody was getting burned. Everybody was getting lit up. And, and what really seems to be, and again, you can say, well, it's Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert's an outstanding quarterback. He is. He's an outstanding quarterback. But what really seemed to be important here was that on a lot of these completions by the Chargers, the secondary really didn't seem to be close to a lot of these receivers. It's not like uh, Herbert put these passes in a tight window and just beat good Chiefs coverage. In a lot of cases, there were no, there were no uh, secondary members within reach of the football at all. And relatively easy passes in a lot of cases here for Justin Herbert. Now, Early in the game, they threw a lot of passes to the running backs. They, the Chargers really did not seem all that interested in establishing the run. We'll talk about that more in a second. They threw a lot of passes to the running backs. Maybe that loosened up the secondary a little bit for the Kansas City Chiefs. But in any case, they had trouble with Mike Williams because of his size. They had trouble with the running backs out there in the flats. They had trouble with the speed of Keenan Allen or just beating people one-on-one. -on -one. The, the, the secondary really did not seem to put up much of a fight. In a lot of cases, they really just seem to be absent altogether of locating the receiver. So I, I don't know what's up there. I don't know if that's a, that's a coaching thing that needs to change or if that's just, a, oh, my goodness, we don't have as good a secondary as we were hoping to have this year. Very messed up this, this week for the, for the Chiefs. Complete F. I don't even hand out Fs on my videos. I'm going to hand out one here for the secondary for the Chiefs. Not trying to beat them down, but if you're looking at what's wrong, the defensive line is having problems. The secondary, they didn't look bad the first two weeks. They looked horrible um, during this week. They at least put up a fight in the first two weeks. This week against the Chargers, it was almost no fight at all. Over to the defense some more. The defensive line, um, going to give them a C overall. They were good against the run. Matter of fact, for the most part, Whenever the Chargers tried to run the football, for the most part, Kansas City shut it down. And that wasn't true on every play, but for the most part, Kansas City was able to shut down the running game for the San Diego Chargers. Matter of fact, San Diego, and I mentioned this, San Diego really didn't seem overly interested in trying to establish the run. They seemed to be perfectly happy throwing the football instead to their running backs out on the flat and just kind of establishing a quasi-running game that way. Not an unusual tactic in the NFL. We've seen that for, for 15 years now from, from coordinators. But the defensive line did a good job uh, stopping the run. They did get some pressure on the quarterback from Chris Jones, from Michael Dana. A lot of guys, though, still aren't getting any pressure on the quarterback. Jaron Reed has, has kind of been absent. We, we haven't seen, and again, uh, if you watch the videos, we, we knew that Jerron Reed was typically not going to be a sack master and never going to be the first guy to the quarterback, but he just hasn't seemed to create as much pressure this year as we would expect him to watching the Seattle videos. He's been absent. The defensive line, though, gets a C overall. It was not a disaster against the Chargers, but again, uh, the Chargers didn't really pressure them a lot by trying to run the football or trying to put them in positions like the Ravens did last week. Um, very, very different game, very different attack from the Chargers this week versus what they saw from the Ravens and from the Browns to run heavy teams. San Diego really <laughs> attacked them completely differently. Um, so uh, the, the Chargers defensive line, of course, didn't have the week off, but they did get some pressure on Herbert, Chris Jones especially, and, and then they were able to stop the run. So I've got a C grade there for the defensive line. If they can hold that up, that'll be decent, but that's not going to be good enough for Kansas City to win a Super Bowl. This defensive line here needs to crank it up. They, they really need to be in the C-plus, B-minus category. Somebody's got to step up, whether it's Wharton or Reed or Naughty or somebody needs to step up and, and create more pass rush here on these quarterbacks, especially up the middle um, versus Chris Jones. And then the secondary can't be playing at an F level. That's, that's just a joke. They've really got to step it up, whether it's a scheme change 
or position change or something. Maybe Thornhill, I, I, again, I don't know what happened to Thornhill. Still, still a little mystery about that. Something's got to, got to get better than the secondary, and the defensive line here has got to be better than that as well. They've got too much money and too many draft picks invested in the defensive line for it to be this pathetic. Um, Michael Dana, all right, this is an interesting name. This is a guy who, in the 2020 offseason, created kind of a buzz in the media, and, and then he, he played decently during the 2020 season, but nothing special, it, 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 nothing that stood out at all. He stood out this game, and, and he spent the entire game basically going up against the rookie tackle for the Chargers. First round draft pick, by the way, Rashawn Slater. And this was an excellent battle, okay? Slater, uh, first round draft pick for the Chargers, playing tackle, and, and versus Dana, they spent most of the game going up against each other. It was an excellent battle from these two players. Um, and Michael Dana held his own. Uh, there were several times, I, I don't remember how many, but he got one big sack and he had several pressures as well, or several times where he beat Slater. And then there were other plays where Slater was able to hold his own as well and basically uh, keep Dana completely out of, out of the backfield at all. Excellent battle here, but what you like to see here from Michael Dana, giving him a C grade here, getting pressure on the quarterback at times. And, and again, other than Chris Jones right now, nobody's doing that for the Chiefs. Absolutely nobody. Absolutely nobody's getting pressure on the quarterback aside from Chris Jones. But Michael Dana did that this game, going up against Rashawn Slater. Good matchup, good back and forth. Hopefully we see more out of that from Michael Dana. Didn't see it so much last year. Saw it here today versus the Chargers. So good game from, from Michael Dana. He, he not only belonged out there, he made a couple of standout plays that got Herbert very uncomfortable. Chris Jones. Giving him an A minus. Now, here's where this gets tricky. All right, Chris Jones had zero sacks. All right, if I remember right, he had zero sacks. So how in the world can you give an A minus to Chris Jones when he had zero sacks? And this is where, this is where statistical analysis breaks down, and you have to watch the videos. Okay, Chris Jones during this game, he only played 60% of the defensive snaps. By the way. Chris Jones, during this game, getting to the quarterback, was unstoppable. Just as unstoppable as Joey Bosa was, all right? Now, he's not quite as fast as Joey Bosa. Bosa's more of a threat off the edge. Off the edge. But Chris Jones beat his man time after time after time after time after time. I mean, the whole game. He was completely unblockable. Now, I think he only got like two quarterback hits, uh, just a couple of hurries, and no sacks. So, statistically... You look up Chris Jones and you think, boy, you know, Chris Jones needs to step it up. Chris Jones does not need to step it up. Chris Jones is stepping it up, all right? He wore out his man the entire game, no matter who he's up against. He was completely unblockable. The Chargers had no choice for him. But, again, here's the point that I, that I wanted to make in the offseason about Chris Jones and his move to defensive end. It's the point I make anytime I'm discussing defensive tackle pressure versus defensive end pressure. The upper tier of quarterbacks, and that includes Herbert, and that includes Mahomes, and that includes Brady, the upper tier of quarterbacks in the NFL, they are so good at getting the ball out quickly that defensive ends like Joey Bosa and Chris Jones have no chance of getting there before the ball is released. Now, that pressure off the edge is still important because you are limiting, you are putting a cap on the clock time that, that, that the quarterback has to make a decision. It's still important. But pressure up the middle, to me, in today's NFL, pressure up the middle from the defensive tackle is more important and, and, and more uncomfortable for the quarterback than pressure off the edge. These quarterbacks are just running slap away from Chris Jones, or they're getting the ball out before Jones can get there. And that's why he's not racking up any statistics, even though he is wearing out anybody who tries to block him. Chris Jones in the running game uh, had, a, had a good day. He was very good in the run. He was not left out there in space like he was against the Ravens. The Chargers did not challenge him out there in space. He did an excellent job in the running game. Matter of fact, what you did find was the Chargers double teaming him, not in the passing game. They're just running away from <laughs> running away from him, rolling away from him, and he's getting pressure on Herbert. But what you did see in the Chargers running game, they were actually double teaming Chris Jones because they felt like he was a threat. And they were actually using two offensive linemen to block Chris Jones in the running game. A little bit unusual there uh, when he's out there at defensive end, but that's what the Chargers were doing. Again, A minus. I cannot stress that enough. Excellent, excellent, excellent game from Chris Jones. 
if you don't believe me, go back and watch the tape, get NFL Game Pass, look it up on YouTube, wherever you want to watch the game at, and just ISO Chris Jones for the entire game and you'll see it. Excellent work here, but it's not having an effect because the quarterbacks can roll away from him every time he beats this man, or they can just run the play away from him uh, in the first place when they're calling the plays. Nick Bolton here. I keep going back to Nick Bolton because A, he's a rookie, and B, he's getting so much playing time, and C, he's doing so well. Now, he's not dominating. He's not in the running for a Pro Bowl by any stretch of anybody's imagination, but Nick Bolton is holding up, and they are asking him to do a lot, especially for a rookie. They are asking him to get pressure on the quarterback. He's doing that a little bit, not a lot, a little bit. They are asking him to be competitive in the running game. He's doing that. He's not dominating in the running game, but he's holding his own. He's going to be one of the diagrams to talk about in a second. In the passing game, this is what's really interesting. In the passing game, when you stop and you look at the film, you find out that as bad as the secondary looked and as bad as some of the other linebackers look at times, not only against the run but against the pass, they are not going after Nick Bolton's area, generally speaking, and they are not going after, generally speaking, whoever Nick Bolton is guarding. Now, I, I don't think he's got an interception. He may not have a pass defense yet this year. But generally speaking, the quarterbacks that he's gone up against, Mayfield, Herbert, and Jackson, they are not targeting uh, uh, Nick Bolton in, in the passing game. Whoever he's guarding or whatever area he's guarding, typically, and especially this was true uh, against the Chargers, Typically, they're not going after Bolton's man or Bolton's zone. Uh, typically, he's doing such a good job uh, with that. They're just not going after him. They're going after everybody else. <laughs> they're going after all the other linebackers. They're going after everybody else in the secondary except for Tyron Matthew. They're going after everybody else, but they're not going after Bolton. They're kind of sort of staying away from him. And it'll be interesting to see if that continues. But so far, Bolton's doing an excellent job in pass coverage, especially against the Chargers. And you know that because they're kind of sort of staying away from him. Now, I know he had that one play on the goal line where uh, Herbert was able to get him to jump up. And as soon as he did, uh, Herbert kind of tossed the ball over his head. But again, somebody in the secondary or, or somebody over there at, 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 the, at the outside linebacker spot should have picked up that wide receiver. That wide receiver was, was way too open. And again, I, I don't know if they teach Bolton to stand still there or to jump. He was trying to make a play. Either way, though, the receiver was way too open. Even if Bolton hadn't have jumped, I, I think the quarterback still would have completed that for a touchdown. But Bolton, generally speaking, is doing very well uh, in pass coverage, especially for a rookie, especially for a linebacker. He's only played his third game in the NFL. Excellent job right there. Um, Juan Thornhill. Uh, not playing. Uh, we're still not sure why. I, I, I don't know if Thornhill just hasn't fully recovered yet and, and he's, he's just not playing very well in practices or if there's something deeper beneath the surface. If you guys know, feel free to run it through the comments. I appreciate it. Willie Gay still not playing yet, I think. And again, he only played 25% of the snaps last year, like 250 snaps. I could be over projecting. I could be too excited about Willie Gay. I've been wrong before, I will be wrong again, but I think Willie Gay is going to help the running game when he comes back. I think he's going to be excellent in run support. I think he's going to be solid in pass coverage. I expect the defense to be helped somewhat by Willie Gay, by Willie Gay's return, maybe not immediately, but as the season progresses. Now, we'll see. We've seen players before who in their first year looked really good, and in year two, they don't. But I, I, I anticipate Willie Gay making some kind of a difference here, especially in the running game for the Kansas City Chiefs when he returns. Uh, uh, the, the Chiefs, I, I mentioned this, they used Blake Bell a lot blocking. I think 23 snaps he actually played this game, only caught one pass, only targeted once. They're using Blake Bell a lot to help out the blocking because the offensive line is struggling so much. Ideally, you don't want Blake Bell in the game that much. And, and that might be one reason why we're not seeing Noah Gray. Um, Noah Gray looked good, pretty good in blocking when he was at Duke University. He seems to be intelligent. But again, when you step up to the NFL, the blitz coverages and, and the blitz pickups are different. It's a lot more to learn. So with Blake Bell here, he's in there for blocking. The reason he's getting so much playing time, 23 snaps this week, is because they need him to help out against uh, against uh, against pass coverage. All right, now, 
two diagrams. So I'll try to make these quick. I know this is already a 30 minute video. We'll talk about Nick Bolton again. This is actually kind of a negative on Nick Bolton, and I don't mean it to be that way, but while we're looking at him, this is just something I'm seeing. And then we'll talk about Orlando Brown and one of the problems I'm seeing there as well. Uh, Nick Bolton is getting blocked or targeted more and more in these games, uh, especially when opposing teams are trying to run the football. Now, so what? Why is that interesting? Well, when we, when we graded him after the draft and we went back and we looked at the grades and, and we looked at him in college, you could see that there were times that he gets swallowed up by a bigger uh, offensive lineman. That is, he does very well when he's going up against the tight end or he's trying to get past a running back, but there are times when larger offensive linemen can kind of swallow him up and he has trouble getting around that. That's because he has average speed average lateral quickness. It's difficult for him to get around, and he's not a very big guy. I think he's somewhere around 245 pounds, give or take. I, I don't know what his latest weight is, but something like that. So when he's going up against an offensive lineman who's in the 290-pound category, they tend to swallow him up, and that's happening here too, okay? That's not necessarily a downgrade, but it's just letting you know what's happening here, and, and this is what this is what is happening. And this could be the tackle or the tackle or the guard, either one, but we'll talk about the tackle today. Because we saw this in San Diego. When when the Chargers are trying to run the football, a lot of times we saw we saw the left tackle go straight, kind of chip right here very quickly. Sorry, yeah, the left tackle. And then stop right here and go straight after uh, after Bolton. Now we didn't see them doing that to all the other linebackers. We saw them doing this to Bolton. And the reason is that Bolton is actually pretty good at stopping uh, stopping the running backs. He's good at tackling. He's good at working his way through the cracks and getting there. But he can get swallowed up. And this is, this is just one of those things when you're trying to grade a guy, when you're trying to forecast how good he might be next year, when in four seasons from now you're trying to decide whether or not to give him a contract extension, when you're trying to grade your draft, when you're trying to do all of those things, this is one of those things that helps to know. Bolton is good against the run. He's good at shifting through the cracks. We talked about one specific running play he, he, does, he did last week that he does. But this is one where he can get swallowed up by these larger offensive linemen. Not always right here at the line of scrimmage, but it's interesting. They, they feel the need to go out of the way to target him. Not necessarily Hitchens. Not necessarily Neiman, but they do feel the need to go after a rookie linebacker. We've seen that more than once. Now, it's successful if Bolton wants to step up his game this offseason or the next offseason. He's got an excellent football IQ. He may have to work on his lateral quickness. He may have to work on his strength to figure out a way to get around these blocks. And that's the kind of thing that separates him from being a good, solid starting linebacker to potentially maybe stepping up to be a Pro Bowl linebacker in a year or two. That's one of the things that you'll see that makes a difference. Okay, so when you when you watch the game, some of these games, you're going to see the tackle or the guard, either one, coming after Nick Bolton, and right now they are able to block him at second level. That is happening. He's big enough. We saw that in the Georgia game last year in college when he was playing in college. The Georgia line, uh, offensive lineman, very big, very strong, able to, to target him. But they're going after him for a reason. So that's a good thing. On, on the bad side, they are having success at blocking him here at the second level. He's having trouble getting around that. On the good side, though, is he's producing well enough against the run that opposing teams feel the need to target him at that second level so that they, they can create an opening. All right, He's the least likely out of linebackers to miss a tackle or to be in the wrong spot out of the linebackers that are currently playing, Willie Gay notwithstanding. All right, so that's just a, a little quick, interesting quirk there for Nick Bolton. Orlando Brown. Orlando Brown is starting to back up or hedge. And I don't know if that's the proper NFL term, but that's my term, okay? And, and, and I'll explain it like this. <coughs> this, is, this is Orlando Brown, and these are opposing defensive ends, okay? The opposing defensive ends, when, when they're speed rushing and edge rushing, their goal is basically to get to a point somewhere here and to get half a step, 
on the left tackle, which in this case is Orlando Brown. And when they're doing that, to break immediately. It's a very sharp break. It's a very sharp break. It's not rounded off. If you round it off, if the, def if the defensive end starts to round this off, He's using a lot of extra steps and extra energy, and that's extra time. You have no chance to get the quarterback. I, I'm not going to bring up a name, but one of the Chiefs defensive ends has been doing that for now the third season, and that's why he cannot get the quarterback. He's just not fast enough, okay? There's a point right here where if the defensive end is fast enough, and we're talking Miles Garrett, uh, we're, we're, we're talking Joy Bosa, but we're also talking about any defensive end who thinks they might be quicker than Orlando Brown. Any, any defensive end at all, they're trying to get that half a step right here on the edge and then sharp break to the quarterback very quickly. Orlando Brown is struggling with this. These speed rushers off the edge. Okay, now he didn't struggle in week two against Baltimore. Backup linebacker he went up against. He did fine there. But he struggled in week one and week three. In fact, he's had no chance at stopping Garrett or, or uh, um, Bosa. That's the problem for him. Now, when he tries, when he tries to move out here a little bit to kind of cut that off, these guys are so quick with either spin moves like Bosa likes to use, or Garrett in some cases is, is big enough to bull rush or just do a quick drop step and slap. They, these guys are able to cut to the inside. So when when Orlando Brown tries to cut off this outside edge here, these defensive ends are quick enough to slide back inside and get a direct path to the quarterback instead, which is even quicker and more devastating. The quarterback has absolutely no shot when that's happening. So because of these struggles, I'm going to erase this and take a look. Because Orlando Brown is struggling in these speed areas, he's having to actually back up or hedge a little bit. So instead of coming out here in a normal blocking pattern and pushing these defensive ends out and around the quarterback, instead of doing that, he is having, because he's, he's struggling, he is having to actually kind of back up to this area right here. And that is his basically, because he's struggling footwork-wise, he's struggling to naturally pick up here at left tackle, that is his only chance to keep these guys from actually having a pass to the quarterback. He's actually, instead of coming out here and blocking, he's actually backing up or hedging backwards toward the quarterback. Now, the problem with that is, even if this defensive end isn't able to beat Brown, it's crowding Mahomes. It's crowding the quarterback, okay? It's actually... They are able to just kind of keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And even though they aren't physically touching the quarterback, and even though they're probably not going to get a sack, it is crowding Mahomes. It takes away from the clean pocket that Mahomes would like to have. It just takes away from that. And basically, Mahomes is feeling that pressure on his left side as he's trying to scan the field. And, and even though this may be Orlando Brown's only way to stop some of these edge rushers from racking up sacks and quarterback hits. It, it, while I, I understand what Brown is trying to do, it's actually also hurting the quarterback spot. It's hurting Mahomes because Mahomes is feeling that pressure. Mahomes doesn't have the chance to look to, to his left as much and as clean as he would like. He, he's feeling that, okay? And that's what's happening with Orlando Brown here. It's another reason why he's continuing to struggle. It's another reason why the Chiefs, I, I understand that they, they put a lot of draft picks toward this trade. It's another reason why they really need to start taking a second look at whether or not they want to invest that much cap space in Orlando Brown. Again, long season ahead. There's 13 more regular season games. Hopefully there's three, three more playoff games. Hopefully there's another Super Bowl. Brown's got a lot of chances to improve, but the early, early returns are not good. This is what we're seeing from him right here, continuing to back up, and these edge rushers are able to actually get him to crowd the quarterback even though they're not beating him off the edge because he's backing up right there. Okay, that's a little messy. Thank you for listening. We will see you next week. Have a great one. Bye.